Congress. Um, Chenur has a list of accomplishments and honors. I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want to give you a very brief um, sort of introduction about her background. Chenur is a professor in electrical and computer engineering department and the Institute for Systems Research. She received her PhD in electrical engineering uh, from Wireless Information Network Laboratory at Rutgers University and uh, her bachelor's and master's in electrical, in electrical and electronics engineering from Bilken University, which happens to be one of the best technical universities in Turkey. Her research interests are in wireless communication theory and networking, network information theory for wireless communications, signal processing for wireless communications, physical layer, and uh, very recently in the area of the energy harvesting, which is a really exciting area, and she's going to tell us more about that today. Shanur has been an associate editor of uh, many distinguished journals in her field, as well as being a technical program committee of her, some of the key uh, conferences in her area. Uh, she's the recipient of the prestigious NSF Career Award, and also uh, one of our ISR Outstanding Systems Engineering faculty. So with no further ado, Shanur, please. So give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Reza. So, um, so today I will talk to you about my research on energy harvesting wireless communications. Um, so this is a relatively new uh, research for me for the last five years about. In fact, we wrote the very first paper on this uh, for an, uh, for, uh, almost four years ago. Um, and um, so all of these things that I will talk to you about is the work of my collaborators. And so this work, energy harvesting work, started with my now former student, Jing Yang. And she uh, formulated the energy harvesting scheduling problem, uh, which I'm going to start my, the, te the, technical talk, the technical part of my talk uh, with. And then she graduated. And then I have uh, Ömür Özel, who is a, gr a senior graduate student. And he started information theoretic side of energy harvesting and also worked on scheduling aspects of it. And then I have Berk Gürekan, uh, who started, together with Ömür, uh, energy cooperation concept that I'm going to get to. Uh, and also, I collaborate uh, very closely with Professor Aileen Yener at Penn State. And she has a student, Kaya Tütüncüoğlu, um, who also works individually and with me on these topics. So today what I will do to you is I'm going to present the work of these students, starting with Jing's work, then Kaya, then Ömür, then Berk. I will go in that direction and then come back to Ömür and then, and then Kaya again. So this is their work, really, and I'm just uh, here to present it. Okay, so what is energy harvesting? Uh, communications. So uh, we, we have some cartoons here to simplify the concept. Over here you see uh, some uh, maybe cell phones and the laptop which are harvesting energy from nature. In this case it is the sun, this is the solar energy. And in, his, in this uh, picture we have a cartoon of an uh, access point or maybe a base station which is getting energy through a wind uh, turbine here. And over here we have a cartoon of something that's underwater and through the currents it is generating energy. So these are some, some things that, that can happen. And we have some more real things that are actual real working things today uh, that use energy harvesting and, uh, and together with communications. So here, uh, starting from, from the left hand side, this is a solar powered base station. Uh, that harvests energy from nature and then uh, uses that to send wireless communication signals. And over here you see a bridge uh, with lots of sensors put over it, over and under it. And they harvest energy maybe from the vibrations on the bridge and also maybe from the sun also. And they make, ma they make some measurements and then they send those measurements to somewhere and they are, they are being useful. You see some shoes here uh, which are harvesting energy uh, kinetic energy from movement and a, a device that's on the body 
And this gets more and more futuristic, uh, what you can do with energy harvesting. Over here, you see an implanted device inside the human body, which will be powered through signals sent from outside to inside uh, to this device. So this will be wirelessly powered. This can be wirelessly powered. And it's going to operate based on this wireless energy. And also, it, will use, it can use this wireless energy to send some observations back out to the doctor's office, maybe, and get, get something done. And even more futuristic, uh, what you see over here is a blood vessel. And inside this blood vessel, uh, there is a very tiny, I guess, can we call it a robot? Something that's moving. And this can be uh, powered by wireless signals that are sent from outside to inside uh, human body. And, uh, and this will get powered. And also, it will make measurements and send those measurements back out. So there are all kinds of uh, energy harvesting possibilities and their connections to wireless communications. I'm a wireless communication the theorist by training, so I'm going to solve some wireless communication problems uh, in an energy harvesting setting. So there, there are scales of uh, things that you can do and that, and that you can accomplish with um, energy harvesting wireless communications. What are those? What are some of the motivations? If you read the abstract, I put some keywords which I, which really excites me uh, to work on uh, and, and, and motivates me to work on energy harvesting communications. So, in uh, broad scales, with energy harvesting, we can have the following uh, advantages. If, if we can design these systems and make them robust technologies, and if people start using them, uh, we will have a lot of good things happening uh, together with energy harvesting and wireless communications. It's, the, what is good about it depends on the scale and the application. For instance, over here, the scale is so large, the used energy is, is so large to power a base station. This, is, this energy harvesting capability will decrease the use of conventional energy from the grid. And it is, it is going to uh, reduce the uh, carbon footprint. It's going to be a greener solution. Uh, that's, that's the case in that. Uh, and this, in this application, maybe the collective amount of energy that all of these sensors use maybe is not too much. Maybe you don't worry, worry too much about the reduction in the use of conventional energy. But what you see over here is an energy self-sufficient, self-contained system. So if you design these things and put them under or over a bridge, then you can let them run in an energy self-sufficient, self-sustaining way. And they will run as long as their hardware allow. So their lifetime will be practically, perp they will have perpetual operation. Their lifetimes will be uh, practically infinity. So that's what's exciting these kinds of applications. These shoes remind me the concept of mobility. Mobility is a very important concept. You don't have to uh, stick somewhere. So you can have access and communicate any data anywhere. So wireless communication, if you think about it, cut the cord in one dimension, the dimension of information transmission. But still, we have the cord to go charge our devices. So if we have, why, if we have uh, naturally energy harvesting systems, then we can cut the cord of uh, charging also, charging and recharging. And then what this means for me as a wireless communication uh, person is true mobility, literally mobile. You can go anywhere, anything, in, any place and then do your wireless communication. And also, you don't have to stop for conventional charging. So charging happens throughout the, uh, uh, so here, perhaps what is most important in this application is the ability to have true untethered mobility. And in these applications, for instance, uh, what is most important is not really the reduction in the conventional the use of conventional energy or uh, or mobility or anything like that. Uh, what, what energy harvesting does for us is the ability to deploy these devices in at hard to reach places. Okay? Uh, for instance, if we want to uh, embed some devices inside the human body, uh, you don't really want to open up, get the device out and charge it and put it back as very often. You don't want to do that. So in this case, energy harvesting capability is just the enabling technology. Uh, so you will enable certain things which are otherwise impossible with conventional battery operation. Yeah. Just a quick question. Yes. Uh, for this last one, in yes. the blood vessel, could you use the flow of the blood to charge the device? In, in principle, you could, I guess. Nobody's done that. 
because I wonder if that would be a natural way to do that. Yes, what I know of in this application is people shine uh, uh, wireless signals from outside to in inside through RF signals, radio uh, signals. They uh, send uh, energy from outside to inside using wireless signals. But I don't know if the other way of harvesting energy is possible. So the point that I'm trying to make over here is that depending on the scale, depending on the application, energy harvesting brings certain advantages. It depends uh, uh, what application it is, the scale of the application, the, uh, the thing that you are looking for. So these are, I think, all exciting things. Uh, but I don't know how to harvest energy myself as a, as a researcher. Um, the, the, uh, we have many colleagues over here on the devices and circuit size of engineering. They, they are uh, designing devices that harvest energy better and better in a more, more efficient way. What I do uh, is I design the communication system underneath. Uh, so, so wireless communications. So we uh, always think about the transmitter and the receiver. In the old days, in conventional wireless communications, we worry about only one queue, which is the data queue. So data comes uh, to a, a node, and then you need to get this data from here to there using the wireless communication channel. Uh, so what, what uh, this energy harvesting capability does to us is that it introduces another dimension to this problem in the form of another queue, which is the energy queue. So as the packets randomly arrive over time to our data queue, energy will randomly arrive to our energy queue, which is the battery. So energy harvesting for us is that there is, a, uh, there is, there is little by little energy that's coming to us from nature through, a, through an energy harvesting mechanism. And what we do is we abstract it out as a stochastic process. Energy becomes available little by little, randomly, intermittently, over time. And what we need to do is uh, be aware of that and send all of these data packets to the other side using this energy. And typically what we ha have is different kinds of goals we have. Uh, sometimes we want to minimize the delay. We have a certain number of packets over here. Uh, using this energy, I want to get these packets to the other side uh, at the smallest uh, amount of time. In other words, minimize the delay. And sometimes for a fixed duration, uh, we want to maximize throughput, which means that uh, using this energy, we want to send as many data packets as possible to the receiver uh, uh, in a given duration. Uh, so this is a kind of technical slide, but it is, it is, uh, the idea is not, uh, not too difficult at all. Uh, so one thing that I need to go on with my uh, communication problem is to somehow relate the utility of energy to my communication problem. So what does it do for me, energy? What energy does is that it gives you power. And then power uh, gives you a rate. So the more power you have, the more uh, a powerful signal that you transmit, a uh, uh, more rate you will get. And there are uh, functions for that. Uh, one very uh, well-known function in communication theory is this log function, which says that if you, if you have a power P, then you can have a rate at that power according to this logarithmic function. Uh, so therefore, we have a way to relate uh, energy to the number of packets that we can send using that energy. From energy, we go to power. Power is the derivative of energy, right? And then from energy, we get to rate. And rate times time, we get to the number of bits. So we, we use a, a rate power relationship. And this, for the most of my talk, this kind of relationship will be the governing uh, relationship. It is a logarithmic uh, function. Uh, it is a concave function, which means that it, it has this kind, of sh this kind of shape. And what it means is as follows. Uh, from the definition of concavity, it says that if you have two powers, let's say power one, with which you can have a rate R of P1, and you have another power, possible power value, with that you have a rate R of P2. So if you use this power for a certain amount of time, P1, and use power P2 for another certain amount of time, what you will get is rate R of P1 plus rate R of P2. And this, this thing says that if you make an average power, if you take the average of the two, uh, 
then and use it for instance for the two durations what you will have is r of p1 plus p2 over 2 the average power and because of the concavity of this function with the average power you will have more rate than the average of the two rates that you can have okay so this is the concept of concavity which log satisfies other functions satisfy also what it tells us for the rest of the talk is a sim single simple idea which is that instead of having two powers power one and power two you will always be better off having using the average power in two time slots okay constant is always good in other words if it is possible for you to have power one and power three instead of transmitting with power one for some time and power two for f power three for some time take the average one plus three over two two uh, so transmit with power two throughout the duration constant power is better because of concavity if you can please remember this this is this is all we have for the rest okay so now let's uh, uh, try to formulate a, a communication problem with energy harvesting. So energies uh, arrive in time. So you harvest E0 amount of energy over here. And then a time later, E1 amount of energy, E2 amount of energy, E3 and so on and so forth. In time, energies come little by little by the energy harvesting process. So I choose to represent this energy harvesting in this y-axis through a cumulative energy arrival curve. Okay, so E0 is this step, and then apparently E1 was small, I harvested small energy, so this jump. And then this big jump, E2, I, we harvested apparently a good amount of energy, then little, then big, then little, and so on and so forth. So energy comes little by little. This is the cumulative energy, and we are trying to find a way to spend this energy in the wireless physical layer in a way that we transmit the most data, but by time t. So that's, that's the problem that, that uh, uh, we have. So we need to figure out power. Equivalently, we need to figure out the con uh, consumption of energy over time. So energy consumption curve is a monotonically non-decreasing curve. You're going to spend energy, so how much energy you're spending is a monotonically non-decreasing, increasing. So it is the integral of the power. The derivative of this thing is, is the power. It is the energy. So one key concept is energy causality. So my consumption curve must lie below this staircase, which is the energy harvesting curve cumulative energy harvesting curve. So then I'm looking for a curve which lies underneath this staircase. That's energy causality, which tells me that I cannot use energy because it become, be, be, before it becomes available. Okay? So c consumption curve must be below the harvesting curve. That's, that's the first idea. The second idea is that now the derivative of this curve is the power. Uh, so we want to keep as constant power as possible, as I discussed in the previous slide. So whichever curve you give me, if I cut it like that and don't change how much energy was spent up to this point or up to that point, if I make it a line, I will always be better off. Why? Because instead of the derivative is the power, instead of having first large and then low power, constant power is always better. So that's the, that's the second uh, idea, that you want to you wanna keep as constant power as possible. Then you would say that, okay, I want to have a single straight line, because that is the constant power from the beginning till the end. Uh, and if you do that, this would be your energy consumption curve, a single constant power, which is the derivative of this thing. Uh, what is wrong with this is that this cuts and goes above the energy harvesting curve. So at this point, you are trying to use energy that you have not harvested yet. Therefore, you want to keep constant powers, but you want to be below the staircase. Okay? And then the next idea comes is that there is no reason really for you to change your power between energy harvests. If you change your power between energy harvests, you can always make a line and you will be better off. Therefore, what we are looking for is a piecewise constant line that lies under the staircase. And also I should maybe clarify that 
the consumption curve must come here. However much energy that you have harvested, you better use it. So at this point, uh, the energy consumption curve must meet energy harvesting curve. Okay? So we are looking for a piecewise linear uh, curve underneath the staircase. And then we notice the following. If I, in this piecewise linear curve, if I go up and then go down, by this I mean in this consumption curve, the derivative is large, then the derivative is small. It means high power first, then low power. You will be better off if you had a constant power. So if you can draw lines, you will always be better off. And this implies that if you increase your power and decrease it, it is suboptimal. And you can show that, in fact, the uh, power should be always increasing. That's another thing that we observe. However, we come over here, if we're going to change the power, we better increase our power, the slope of this curve. Okay? So we know that we want to draw constant lines, but it is not feasible over here. I just cannot do that. So we have the idea that I will go constant, and at one point I will have to change it. There is no other way. So where should I change it? So this curve, this graph shows you that if at one point you are changing your power, and which has to be at an energy harvesting uh, moment, as we have discussed. So if you are changing your power at a situation like this, uh, which uh, this is the point that your consumption curve is not equal to the harvesting curve. If you are changing your power from low power to high power, low slope to high slope, you will always be better off by going through this constant, constant line. So if you have to change the power, it must be a place where you cannot draw this constant line. That concludes to you that if you're going to change the power, it has to be at a point, energy harvesting point first of all, but also you have to touch the upper stair, uh, the staircase because there is no way to draw a constant line over here. And this point, when you touch the staircase, it is the point where your energy harvested and energy used are equal, so your battery is empty. So the next rule is, you will have to change power sometime, but for it to be optimal, when you change power, your battery must be empty. Okay, so that's the next idea. So then we, we want to find the uh, power allocation policy. Uh, we have the staircase. I'm trying to get a piecewise linear curve underneath. And I want to keep as constant as possible because of concavity. Uh, I cannot draw any one of these very long constant lines because I'm cutting the staircase. So I will take the constant power that takes me as far as, as far away as possible. So I will come to this point. I cannot take any other constant line that's not going to cut this, cut this staircase. Okay, then from here, the battery is empty, everything starts over. So we will try all of these constant lines, and then this will be my second uh, power value. Andre. So you don't know in advance what the upper curve will be, though? I, for, for this part, thank you for reminding that, for this part of the talk, I assume that I know this uh, energy harvesting. So you know the future of when energy will be harvested? Yes, for this work, I'm assuming that. So I assume that exactly when and how much energy will be harvested. So I know this energy harvesting curve. And I'm trying to find the energy, best energy consumption curve. Uh, you can view this as a, as a benchmark for performance. You cannot do any better than that if you know these energy harvests only causally. That's one thing. The other thing is there are applications where people really do know roughly energy harvesting times and amounts. Like for instance, in indoor environments, if you harvest energy from these lights, uh, then you know when the lights will be on and off, and then you can figure out, or s for solar energy also, uh, there are studies how much energy you will harvest and what time you will harvest. So there are applications where this is feasible. For other applications where knowing this is not feasible, it's a, it's a performance benchmark. Yeah, please. Are you assuming there's a battery, so the energy is stored? Yes, exactly. And that's a good point. That's going to actually take me to the next uh, work that I'm going to uh, tell. In fact, here, I assume that... Hold on, Ankur. Uh, I assume that uh, there is a arbitrarily large battery, so I can save as much as I want, but the next work uh, will change that assumption. Ankur. Yes. And you're asking why, right? Yes, good. So this, uh, uh, this from 
my per perspective, somebody who doesn't know much about the uh, devices side of it, uh, we started to model it this way because maybe you will harvest a little bit of energy and it will be worth it. You have a sufficient amount of energy and it, it will be worth it and counted as, okay, I have harvested some energy and then you save it in your battery. Uh, so that's what was the thinking. But if you uh, do a continuum of energy harvesting, what will happen is that my staircase will be just an arbitrary monotonically increasing function. In which case, I will also do similar things. Instead of drawing these lines uh, to the corner points, I will have to draw tan tangent lines to, the, uh, to that upper curve. It is possible, but we form Jing formulated the problem this way originally, and, and yeah. Is it easier to formulate a problem like this? Than Cleaner, I would say, but nowadays there are actually works which, which uh, do it the, uh, the more general way. Andre. So, in a case where it's not piecewise constant, the solution would, would be the convex hull? Yeah. So it's already a convex hull. It's already a convex hull, yeah. You have a paper? No, somebody has a paper on that. Yeah, uh, yeah basically, uh, und underneath that uh, thing that you will, you will draw, uh, uh, it will be a con uh, I guess, yeah. I mean, you will draw the, uh, uh, draw the lines and we convexify it, uh, and then, uh, yeah. So let me go. The largest convex function, which is under the curve. Yes, but except the last edge, right? Except the last edge. Is Kaya here? Kaya, what is the answer? <laughs> yes. Yes, Con uh, boundary of the convex half. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, convex, the convex half is a consequence of uh, of stating that it should be uh, linear wise or the opposite. I mean, can you can you, can uh, can you not obtain yeah. that it's. Uh, uh, you state a problem and then just optimize it and you get that it. it's, uh, it's the boundary of a common, the common skull of this cube. So, so imagine that... And if it's checkwise, it will be linear wise, yeah? It will be piecewise linear, but sometimes you will not be able to draw these things. So imagine like an energy harvesting curve, a, a, a different kind of curve. If you can draw a line, which will be tangent to that line, and then that's a good line, you will keep it. But then uh, there may not be other opportunities for you to draw any lines from the beginning till the end, then you may have to follow that curve and then draw another line to the end. And that's, that's what the solution is gonna be. Okay, uh, so as was pointed out uh, over here, in this, we really assume that the battery is uh, uh, arbitrarily large, and we can save energy. And if you look back at this solution, what really is happening is as follows. You have harvested relatively large amount of energy over here, and you are stretching it out up to this point. Uh, and the difference, the difference of the top curve and the bottom curve is how much energy that, that you have in your battery at that time instant. Okay, so the difference, and over here the battery is empty, you have used all that you have harvested, and then you harvest a large amount, instead of just using it, you stretch it out constantly and slowly, and you are lucky again, large amount of uh, energy harvest. But we have large enough battery that whatever we harvest, we assume that we can save it, so that enables us to draw these constant lines uh, throughout. Then the next work was that what if you have a finite sized battery? Okay, so the finite size we will call it Emax, which means that uh, the energy that you can save in the battery cannot exceed Emax. Okay, so therefore the difference between energy harvested, again upper staircase, and energy consumed, whatever the curve that we will draw. That difference, the amount of energy in the battery should not exceed Emax because the moment you exceed it, you are wasting energy. Even though you want to take your time, spend energy as slowly and as constant as possible, when you have a finite battery, 
What you want to do also is to speed up a little bit to open up space in the battery so that you can accommodate upcoming energy harvests. Okay? And that introduces this lower staircase, which is exactly Emax down from the upper staircase, which is energy, uh, which is the energy harvesting curve. So we have two things here: uh, cumulative energy harvested and minus Emax, which is which is this curve over here. So what we need is we need to find an energy consumption curve again. How do I consume consume energy? First of all, you cannot cut the above uh, uh, energy harvesting curve. It is against energy causality. You are trying to use energy that you haven't harvested. If you cut the lower staircase, if you cut it over here, for instance, then you are trying to you are attempting to save more than Emax amount of energy in the battery. You will not be able to do that, and you will spill energy over, and you never wanna waste energy. So instead of therefore doing uh, slow energy consumption, you wanna speed up a little bit and don't overflow uh, any any energy. So we are looking for this energy consumption curve, monotonically non-decreasing. Uh, within this, what we what is called energy feasibility tunnel. So you wanna be within this tunnel, and uh, you wanna have an energy consumption curve. As before, you wanna have constant power as much as possible. And as before, there is no reason to change power between energy harvests. So we are looking for a piecewise uh, linear curve starting from the origin, ending at the uh, total energy harvested. So we wanna draw. This red, red curve is okay, the blue curve is okay, but what is optimal? What is the best curve? Uh, so we have the following rules. Um, so maybe I should say the following. When you touch the upper staircase and the battery is empty, energy consumed equals energy harvested. When you touch the lower staircase, battery is full. Uh, because uh, uh, so the difference between energy harvested and energy used is exactly Emax. So if the battery is full and somehow you find yourself touching the lower staircase, you should never increase your power. In, uh, so this slope slope is increasing over here. You should never do that because if you are able to do that, you can always do a constant power. When battery is full, never increase your power. On the other hand, when battery is empty never decrease your power. If you are decreasing it, you can always do a constant power, which will be better off. Okay, so this tells you that, then have these constant stretches of powers, and then uh, at one point you have to hit either the top or the bottom staircase. When you hit the top staircase, you need to increase your power, you cannot decrease. And then when you hit the lower staircase, you need to decrease your power. And then what you have is a power allocation. You start with a low power, and then your battery becomes empty, and then more power, a higher power, then your battery becomes full, and then uh, a lower power. Yeah. So it looks like it should always be the shortest power. Yes. The two extreme corners, right? That, that remains in Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that would be true even if it's not piecewise constant. The, 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 the uh, even, yes, constant. exactly, exactly. So the idea that emerges is that you need to draw the tightest curve uh, in the energy feasibility tunnel. It's gonna minimize, it, this, is the, this is also the shortest, it is the shortest string. It is the tightest curve in the energy feasibility uh, tunnel. And from a, you know, maybe we lost what is happening in the wireless communication channel. We have too many pictures, and then I'm telling you something geometric. What's happening is that you are harvesting energy little by little over time, and you have a finite battery to save it. So this is giving you this constraint that you don't want, you never want your battery to overflow. And what we are finding here is that you need to keep. Uh, constant power to the extent possible, but your battery sometimes will be empty, sometimes full, and you have to change your power accordingly. Here we have basically three powers, a low power, a higher power, and a lower power. So the transmitter here changed the power, transmit power, three times throughout the duration. It wished not to change the power at all, but these constraints forced it to change the power three times throughout this communication session. When you do that, you uh, sends the maximum amount of data from the transmitter to the receiver, 
uh, using this harvested energy subject to this finite battery. Okay, so the next thing, uh, I'm going to show you a redoing of this, and it's going to give us another algorithm if you are familiar with that. And if you like uh, uh, convex optimization, Lagrangians and KKTs and stuff like that, maybe you will uh, relate to this better. So at this point, we know that we will have piecewise linear curves, which means that we will have constant powers between energy harvests. Uh, so we have the energy, so I can work in a finite dimensional vector space, the powers, P's. I will have PIs, powers, and LIs are the durations of, of, these, of these durations between energy harvests. So energy causality says that energy used, power times time, energy used, must be, ener must be less than energy harvested. And no energy overflow condition, which is the lower staircase, tells you energy harvested minus energy used must never exceed the size of the battery. And then our throughput, the usual log function, this is the rate, times the time, which is the throughput, number of bits. And then you have, um, you will have an optimization problem. And the reason that we are constructing this problem uh, is that now we will be able to handle this fading in the wireless communication channel. So another thing about wireless channels is that they go up and down over time. They are never constant. Uh, so that's this fading. In this fading situation, you get your data packets, you get your energy in a finite sized battery. And, um, and then how should you control your power? Andre? What you showed so far, you did not use the fact that it's a log, right? Just the fact that it's concave. Yes, absolutely. It is a concave, monotonically increasing function. So yes, it, absolutely. A bitterly concave function, you get the same result, right? Exactly. And that's exactly the reason that the result is the shortest. Uh, the length also is a concave function uh, in that situation. Therefore, that's also whatever your cost, concave cost function is, you will always get the same solution. Absolutely. So we are. In effect, we are constructing the same problem, but in a more mathematical may way, maybe, and handling the fading also. Uh, so this is our total throughput, summing over all epochs, what we call epochs. And this is energy causality, energy used, less than energy harvested. This is no energy overflow, energy harvested minus used, less than Emax. Okay, so this is the same problem. You can do the Lagrangian if you take a convex optimization class, for instance. And then you will find uh, this optimal power allocation in terms of these Lagrangians. And if you're familiar with the concept of water filling uh, from, for instance, communication theory classes or information theory classes, what you have over here is a form of water filling that we call directional water filling for the following reason. Uh, so now imagine that we are in a fading channel, so the channel is good and bad, uh, which determines the bottom of a container, uh, good, good channels, bad channels. Good channels are lower in the bottom, bad channels stick out like that. And then you uh, have energy, and then you put your energy, uh, and you, the height is the power. As we saw, you want to equalize the powers as much as possible, and water filling does exactly the same thing. And nature does exactly the same thing when you fill water, when you pull it uh, on a, in a container with a uh, strange bottom. Uh, it's going to level, therefore powers will uh, level. And uh, this is exactly what we observe here with a new twist in this energy harvesting situation. So the twist is uh, the following, that you want to uh, you want your powers to level out, to, be, uh, to, uh, to fill the, the water, except now the water filling should, will be directional. You can only fill the water to the right, not to the left, because wanting to have the water flow to the left uh, will be against energy causality. You will attempt to use energy that you have not, not harvested yet. Okay? So over here, for instance, uh, you harvested energy, it's a lot. And then it goes, uh, spills to the other side. It goes and fills the, uh, fills the bottom over here and levels as much as possible. Uh, but you see that there is still some, some things that are not going. There, so there is more opportunity to level out completely. And the reason for this is a finite Emax constraint. So if you send a little bit more water, then you're going uh, to spill uh, energy over. So in this following slide, I will summarize to you what I told you uh, so far. Uh, so I told you about a situation uh, with 
two equivalent but different looking solutions. Um, so energy is harvested. And from a geometric point of view, we have the energy harvesting curve and no energy overflow curve. And, and then the, the best uh, energy consumption curve is the shortest string in the energy feasibility tunnel. Equivalently, I told you about this water filling interpretation. Communication theorists are used to this. They like it. So imagine now these blue things, the energy that's harvested, uh, that's the area, and the height is the power. So you want to equalize as much as possible. So you want to fill the water. Uh, but here, uh, because of energy causality, the water will flow only to the right. Uh, energy you can take, save, and use it later, but you cannot use it earlier. So in the next slide, you will see exactly that. Maybe we should do this a couple of times. So this big, vo big water, big energy, this big energy that's harvested over here, it fills to the right. Uh, similarly, this big energy that's harvested, it levels, but fills only to the right. And then when you look at this mid mid middle stretch, for instance, this constant power, uh, what you see is that even though you want the energy to level as much as possible, fill as much as possible, uh, you are unable to do it to the left and to the right, and for two different reasons. To the left, letting this water go to the left is equivalent to trying to use energy that we have not harvested yet. So it is against causality, energy causality, because of that we have to have this step. And it is the same idea over here in the energy feasibility tunnel. You want to have a constant line like that, but you're cutting the upper staircase against energy causality. And over here, it, it is going to flow to the right. It seems OK. It was, it was going to be OK. It would be OK if you didn't have this breaking point, which is due to finite Emax. So if you let water flow to the right, the battery will overflow, which you don't want. And because of that, this is the, the most amount of leveling off that you will have, most amount of water filling that you will have. You will not have uh, anything better than that. All right? OK. So I guess I have about like 15 minutes, maybe, something like that. So let me uh, tell you another uh, concept. Maybe uh, for information, I should tell you that we and other people worked on uh, various versions of this problem. Uh, for instance, a broadcast channel uh, where the transmitter is harvesting energy. For instance, imagine this thing to be an access point or a base station, having data to two users and harvesting energy from nature. And we, we have results for that. Uh, imagine this is called multiple access channel. Uh, imagine multiple sensors. Uh, which, which create data or have data, and they want to send it to a single receiver, maybe a collector node, uh, over a common wireless channel, in which case you will have two transmitters which, have, which are harvesting energy from nature and, and, uh, and also wanting to send their data to the receiver. This is a multiple access channel. We have results for that. And uh, there are results for interference channel and other types of channels. Uh, two-way channels and all that. Uh, this is somebody else's work, which is not our work, but uh, we use this work as a stepping stone to our next uh, concept that, that I want to tell you about. So what I will do is I will skip through uh, this and talk about this other work that exists in the literature, and then from that let me introduce another concept. So here, this, the setting is that you have a relay channel. There is a source, and there is a relay, and there is a destination. Uh, so the source wants to send some data to the destination, but for whatever reason, it cannot uh, reach it. Maybe there is a building in between, or there is a mountain or something. But there is a relay uh, which the source can reach wirelessly, and, and the relay can reach the destination. Uh, this, this can be, for instance, two sensor nodes in tandem uh, to the collection node. They are both harvesting energy from nature, and we want to send this data end to end from the source to the destination. Okay? So let's say we want to look at this problem. Uh, so this is, as I said, somebody else's uh, work. Uh, so you would imagine a, a solution where the, the source is trying to find a power, transmit power. It knows its own energy harvesting. But you would think that maybe it will need to know uh, the 
relays energy harvesting profile so that it just sends the data right at the right time so that the relay can forward with the harvested energy and all that. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a surprising separation-based solution, which I will mention. Uh, here, again, we have rates uh, from source to relay, a log expression, and a rate expression with relay's power to destination. Uh, so these are energy causality, usual things. Once you keep seeing them, uh, sources, powers, integral, sources consumed energy, less than sources, harvest, sources harvested energy, and relays uh, used energy, less than relays harvested energy. And there is an additional constraint over here, which is the data causality. This is the rates integral over time. It's the number of bits. So this is how much bits, how many bits the relay can forward, and it has to be less than the number of bits that, that have arrived at the, uh, at the relay. So it is a data causality here in this picture. It means that the amount of data that the relay can forward is only less than the data that has arrived to it. Otherwise, you cannot make up data. And then you can construct a problem as they did. Uh, maximize the rate of relay to the destination. This is, this is the limiting, this is the binding uh, rate. Uh, you maximize that subject to energy causality at the source, energy causality at the relay, data causality at the, at, uh, at the relay. And then you, you know, this looks like a uh, complicated optimization problem. What they showed uh, is kind of remarkable. What they show is that a separation-based policy is optimal. By this, they mean the following. Uh, for, don't look at this mathematics. But what they, say, what they say, maybe I should show it in this picture. They say that with the harvested energy, the source should send as much data as possible to the relay without really paying attention to how much energy the relay has harvested. So the source should dump as much, ener as much data as possible to the relay. And then the relay. Uh, will use it is, it is energy and send this incoming data to the extent possible with it is, with it is uh, harvested uh, energy. So there is a separation over here. The source does its own thing as if this is a single user channel. And the relay does its own thing as if this is a, this is a single user channel uh, with energy harvesting and data arrival, uh, a, a arrival sequence. That's their solution. Um, let's keep that solution in mind. In the next 10 minutes, let me talk to you about wireless energy transfer so as, a, as a new concept. Uh, so if we can think about um, devices harvesting energy from nature, and if we can think about the fact that this energy harvesting can be from RF signals, radio wave radio signals, then the following idea is not a stretch at all. If they are harvesting, if a de device is harvesting, is able to harvest RF energy uh, from nature, maybe we can send man-made energy uh, to, that, to, that, uh, to that entity, right? Um, if there is that capability. And this, this is the concept of wireless energy transfer, uh, where people, again, in the circuits and devices side of uh, uh, engineering, they know how to do this. There are, uh, there are papers, many papers, actually. Uh, so this is a cartoon of the situation. So you, uh, I guess, by inductive coupling in this case, uh, you send and wirelessly charge your devices in a room. Uh, this picture uh, shows that you know at a distance you can light a bulb, which shows that you are able to send uh, power or energy. And again, this brings me to these applications where maybe the impact of energy will be uh, the most signif significant in the sense of just enabling something that's otherwise impossible with conventional battery operation. So uh, we can send uh, energy to this device from outside to in inside uh, human body uh, wirelessly and also to the, to the blood vessels and uh, to everywhere. So this is the concept of uh, energy, wireless energy transfer. Uh, let me uh, tell you what, it's, what the implication of this for wireless communication is. So let's think about the sun again and think about the sensor network in an area, maybe in a forest or somewhere. And uh, some nodes get uh, uh, energy from nature in a good, good way, so their uh, yellow batteries are full. But maybe some nodes are in the shade or they are far away, they don't have uh, 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 energy. So we in wireless communications, we have the concept of cooperation for some number of years now, maybe 10, 11 years. Before even 
know, when I was a graduate student about 20 years ago, uh, we didn't have the concept of cooperation. At the time, we thought that the only wireless communication was from the cell phones to the tower, uh, from the tower to the cell phone. And then about 10, 11, 10, 11 12 years ago, people started talking about what if this cell phone sends data to that other cell phone which forwards to the base station or the other way around? So then we got used to this concept of cooperation through wireless signals. Uh, that you know, the, it, it is no issue nowadays. You know, new graduate students take it for granted. Or you know, of course we have cooperation. So it's something simple nowadays, uh, a, a very usual concept. That you know, nodes will uh, wireless signals will receive them and forward them. So this happens all. Uh, so we are here uh, trying to introduce a new cooperation uh, concept, which is energy cooperation. So if some nodes are harvesting a lot of energy, and other nodes are nearby, but they are unable to harvest naturally energy, then can we have some of these nodes send their energy uh, to other nodes? And have them uh, do do have, have them uh, do whatever they are supposed to do. So just like wireless signal tr uh, transformation transfer, we want to think about wireless energy transfer. Then when you think like that, it becomes the the entire network becomes like a big huge battery. So. The entire network owns the energy, and within the network, you share the energy, and the network accomplishes a, a, a certain task. And through this uh, energy cooperation, also you enable some applications that are otherwise impossible. So this uh, formulation of this in a wireless communication context uh, happened in, with the following work, and we uh, got uh, motivated by the previous work that I told you about. So now imagine a, a, a relay network where we have exactly the previous situation, except now we have the possibility of energy cooperation, which means that you send a little bit, one node sends a little bit of its energy from its battery to the other, other node, subject to, a, subject to a loss. When you send delta i, only alpha times delta i reaches to the other, other side, and one minus alpha is lost. In fact, today's virus energy transfer efficiencies are very low. In fact, but they are getting uh, getting better and better, and it also depends on the application, depends on the distance. But this is what we want to think about. So to motivate it from the previous work, uh, they they thought about the separation-based policy. So they have some amount of energy over here, and with that energy, they dump as much data as possible to the to the relay. Okay, three units of uh, data comes. And the relay has a little bit of energy, and it, it is able to forward only one data packet. So the end-to-end -end throughput is one data packet. You got this data to this midpoint, okay, but it didn't really accomplish anything for the end-to-end -end, uh, end -end communication. So you can do the following, for instance. This is, uh, this is the energy cooperation concept. The relay, the, the source, instead of dumping a lot of data packets, it should send some number of data packets uh, using some of, some of its energy. And then the remaining part of the energy, it should just send to the relay. Uh, subject to, subject to a, uh, obviously, energy inefficiency, energy transfer inefficiency. What's going to happen is that you will have fewer fewer data packets arriving over here, but a little bit more, more energy that will help to forward them to the destination. If you do that, then your end-to-end -end throughput is increased to two, back, two packets. So the idea is you want to send data end-to-end, -end, send a little bit of data, a little bit of energy, so that this network as a whole performs in the best way that it can by their collective wireless communication channel and their collective energy harvested. That's the concept of energy cooperation. And you know, so we wrote some papers. We have some uh, optimization problems, and and things like that. But what I want to show you, uh, pr probably as a, as the last thing, and then I will talk about what I think are some open problems uh, in this field. Uh, this concept in a two-way communication uh, channel. Now, uh, from this relay, think about the two-way communication channel. Bo there are two uh, wireless users want to send data to each other. They both harvest energy, and there is one-way energy cooperation. A practical application, for instance, you can imagine RFID uh, uh, net networks. So this could be the reader, and the, this could be the RFID node, 
So the reader shines energy, which, is, which gets reflected by the RFID node uh, to send data back. So you can imagine, uh, as an example of this setting, this two-way communication, you can Im imagine that. So here then, what's going to happen for us, what we find interesting is that, uh, first of all, our energy is flowing in time already uh, through this power allocation. We harvest energy, use it slowly in time. Now there is the opportunity of energy flow in space from user to user. And that will bring uh, to us the concept of uh, two-dimensional directional water filling. Uh, and the concept here is uh, this, through a picture again. Uh, imagine these two users. Uh, user 1 harvests 0 and 12 units and then 0 units. And then the user 2 harvests 6 and 6 units and no, no energy harvesting. And now uh, if these two users are just doing their best to communicate data in both directions, this will do directional water filling, and, uh, and then it will divide its uh, 12 units of energy as 6 and 6. The, the, the constant, the more constant, the better. But it cannot uh, make it, for instance, 4, 4, 4, uh, because it is not allowed to use energy bef bef before you have harvested. Energy flows only to the right. And the same thing for the second user. This is the uh, other end of the communication. It harvested 6, 6. It can e equate. Uh, distribute its energy equally as 444. And this would have been the case if these two nodes are harvesting energy and sending data to each other. Now we're ena enabling energy cooperation, which means that one user uh, can send energy to the other user through energy cooperation. In that case, what happens is that you have directional water filling, but in two dimensions. Energy can flow from left to right in time, and it can flow from top user to bottom user in space. And then this energy will flow in this network and then you will get everything equalized and the largest total throughput for the system. And you will see this in this cartoon that uh, my students did. Uh, so let's start from the beginning. Everything, all of these, uh, these things are closed. They allow water to go. And then they open and then water flows to right. There is an equilibrium. And then these, these things open and water flows down. And then the system reaches this equilibrium uh, where all but one uh, energy uh, are equal. This is impossible because this energy cannot flow to the left due to energy causality in time. And this energy cannot flow to the top because only user one is sending energy to user two. It is not two-way. OK, now let me get to the end of it. and. Uh, talk, try to talk a little bit about future directions uh, in this field. Um, so there are many open problems. Um, one is about fundamental limits. Uh, for instance, information theory of energy harvesting communication systems. Most interesting problems are mostly open. Uh, what is known today is uh, the information theoretic capacity of a link, a single user link, uh, with an energy harvesting transmitter. Uh, when the battery at the transmitter is either very large or very small. These two extremes are known. Uh, but if it is somewhere in between, like a normal uh, practical uh, communication device for a finite sized battery, we don't know what the information theory capacity is. And this is, this is a good open problem. Uh, then the, there are problems related to privacy and security con uh, concerns. All of a sudden, in these networks, this concept of energy state becomes uh, 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 becomes a new component. So, how much a node, uh, how much energy a node has, will tell some things about that node's behavior, how it is using it, whether you know the, what what is the uh, daily activities, I guess, of that node, and uh, for other purposes also, uh, it becomes something. How much uh, en energy a node has becomes something special uh, to that node. And then there are issues related to privacy and uh, security concerns. Uh, I didn't tell you anything about receiver-side energy harvesting. Obviously, if the transmitters are harvesting energy, receivers will be harvesting energy also. At the transmitter side, uh, co formulating the problem is easier because we know how to connect energy to an action that the transmitter wants to do, which is to send data. 
So we have the rate power relationship. We go from energy to power, power to rate, rate to number of bits. So at the transmitter side, we can understand what a, a little bit of a unit of energy does for us, and we can construct our problems and solve them. At the, at the receiver side, it is more blurry. Uh, with a unit of energy, what can the receiver do? The receiver has to do decoding, it has to do sampling, it has to do computation, it has to do maybe decompression of compressed signals, uh, it has circuitry, uh, transmitter has circuitry also. But at the receiver side, uh, it is more uh, blurred, the problem. That's why there are fewer papers on the receiver side, and therefore there are more open problems uh, on the receiver side. As Andre said at the very beginning, uh, what I told you today are all what they call, what we call offline problems, in the sense that we know the energy harvesting profile. Looking at this profile, we do our best. But obviously, in some applications, in most applications, uh, you will not know how much and when you will harvest energy. Uh, so you need to do online algorithms, algorithms that use only the information up to now. I know how much energy I have harvested. Somehow I need to figure out what to do without knowing exactly uh, how much I will harvest in the future. That calls for adaptive and learning algorithms. Transmitters and receivers need to learn from the environment what kind of harvesting situation is going on and what, what kind of uh, uh, things uh, that they should do. Um, one thing that's very exciting, I think, is the possibility of sending both information and energy by the same signal. That's, that's, a, that's a really exciting possibility if this, uh, you know, this can be implemented in a robust way. In the little uh, work that we did that I told you about, we have two separate links. So I sent data using RF maybe, and I sent energy on another channel, maybe using RF, maybe using uh, coils or, or some other means. Uh, so can we send a signal, single signal and that gets to the receiver, from that you get information, decode it, and, and also get energy from it. Can, can this be done? And uh, also, uh, now that we have signal cooperation in wireless networks, routing and uh, forwarding, relaying and all that, and we are getting used to the idea of uh, energy cooperation, uh, we want to have some practical algorithms and, and we want to see networks of the future, okay, um, where in a way energy networks and information networks converge in some sense, and this is happening in smart grid to some extent. Uh, energy flows and information is used in that case, but can we have um, a network uh, in a wireless environment, everything is in the air, and information is flowing through this network from the sources to destinations, which is happening today wirelessly. Uh, can we have also energy to flow in this network from energy rich sources to energy starving uh, nodes? And you know, this becomes basically a network uh, where uh, you have a convergence of energy and information flow simultaneously. With this futuristic thought, uh, and with these references, if you want to read more, I would like to stop, Reza. Thank you for a very exciting talk. We have uh, time for a few questions. Please. Um, I had a question about your uh, the plot of your energy accumulate, like uh, energy accumulation. Plot. Yes. Yes. Seem like really, really ideal condition where you had this very tipped point of energy accumulating, like very yes. point. But if, like, if it were to be in, act, I was curious if it's based on some actual energy harvesting system. Like, if it was that graph based, or was it just from like imagination that this point will have this amount of energy? It is for us, I mean, we, we try to keep things general. For, for our purposes, there is some energy arrival uh, profile. Okay, so it's a, to simplify the question of your... Uh, to, uh, I guess that's what, what we need to solve our problem. So energy harvesting devices, how much energy you harvest, you know, are you uh, harvesting very efficiently and all that. Uh, we abstract it out as, okay, in time, here is my energy arrival uh, profile. And then we start from there. And 
Um, therefore, we can work with anything, any, any given uh, energy harvesting profile. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, matter too much for us. Okay. Yeah. Yes. The same, uh, the same initial setting. If you do not, don't know the, what the energy profile. But yes. You know, you know the you know the energy profile. To be, uh, you know the probability the distribution of the energy profile. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. This, this is what we would like you to know. To be, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything wrong? I mean, what I know is that we did a little bit of work uh, on that and also other people. Uh, all I know is, personally, I know that you can do dynamic programming. Uh, there is, you know, so you, th there is throughput uh, up to now and there is an expected throughput for the future. And then you can do a dynamic programming formulation and then you can do the value iteration, the standard dynamic programming thing. If we call it a solution, we have a solution to that extent. But I mean, dynamic programming, I don't know if, if it is a, uh, you know, if it is a satisfactory solution. That is, that is mostly what's done. There are additional uh, works, I think. Uh, but uh, basically, it comes to dynamic programming. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the uh, rate power relationship. Yes. So I think for many like low power communication systems, yes. they tend to use first mode to transmit data. Yes. Which kind of contradicts to the model you have here. Um, so um, so what might be the problem? I mean, I mean if you if you say that you're gonna do burst T communication as a practical system, you can do that, but its throughput is gonna be less than if you spend your power uh, little by little over time. But uh, you know, this, we at the very beginning, I assumed this concave rate power relationship. That is, in normal communication theory, information theory, that's mostly the case. You have a, a concave relationship. And, uh, but that underneath stuff that I didn't tell you is what you do as a communication mechanism to achieve that kind of rate power relationship. It requires you to uh, have a certain kind of code book, have a certain optimal way of you know, coding, decoding, things like that at the, at the physical layer. And if you want to maximize, so that's, that's the rate power relation, relationship, right? That's the, what, uh, the best that you can do in the physical layer. And given that relationship, if you want to maximize throughput, uh, then you have to do this slow and constant power transmission. If you say, for practical reasons, I'm going to do bursty communication, you can do that. Uh, it, it is, you know, you can choose that for other reasons. Maybe it is simpler or maybe it is more convenient for your application. But the rate, I mean, the throughput will be less, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so do you assume that the trading is very constant between two uh, capacity? What we do is we have these two things. Uh, we define like this combined epoch. Uh, so, the, so you harvest energy here and then energy here. And then, so this is your energy epoch. Um, in terms of what, you know, in terms of battery, nothing much is happening as far as the battery is concerned. Uh, but there is also parallel to this fading, fading situation. So you can have fading being constant throughout, or you can have a, a fading and another fading. So then what we define an epoch is the time duration where things keep constant, which is no energy arrives and no, uh, uh, the channel doesn't change. So we have this, this kind of thing. So it is flexible, actually. You can have your fading to remain constant for longer than energy epochs or shorter. You can, you can do either way. Questions? Well, maybe I can end it by asking sort of a far-fetched view. Yes, and, so, and then I will end it by not being able to answer. No, no. <laughs> so for the longest time, Professor Lucas and I have been trying to collaborate. Uh, so I make all these devices, right, in terms of energy harvesting and battery. That's what we do in my group. And this whole field of biomedical devices is blossoming. And, and we now have examples that you have patches for drug delivery. You have uh, gadgets that they are implanted in your body for, yeah. um, you know, bacterial infections. I mean, you name it. It's just it's just hitting the industry right now. Yes. So imagine a situation that you have all these devices. Yes. And uh, they all have to work yes. at the same time. Yeah. So there's a concept of the power management. Yes. Energy management and the media by which this 
transmission need to take place? So what are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think it tells us that you and I, we will have jobs for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would love to take some of this and yeah. bring this to my field. Yes. Because we are so passive and yeah. we only develop one single device, we yeah. test it and then you're happy. Yeah, but then what I want to do is I want to put it in a network of devices and have them communicate and do the optimization of it, I guess. Uh, so I, I guess I have two thoughts about this. One is that, you know, I, I, I have been doing wireless communications for the past 20 years. I calculated that, but starting from the beginning of my PhD. So I started my PhD in 1993. So it's been tw 20 years. And when I first started, we, like I said during the talk also, all I could imagine as a wireless communication was uh, from a cell phone to a base station and base station to a cell phone. And even at the time, I didn't have a cell phone when I was working on cell phones. And uh, so then, you know, wireless communication changed. Cell phones are now a robust technology. Everybody has it. Everybody has multiple of them. Uh, it is robust. But then, you know, the, the more we solve these problems, all of a sudden other problems uh, come out. Now, okay, cell phones are understood, but there are body area networks, in body networks, and then there is a smart grid, and then big scale, smaller scale sensor networks in the bri bridge, over the bridge, in the uh, cement, you know, the, the concrete, I guess. Uh, so, you know, every uh, time we, it seems like we understand something, uh, it feels like we are opening up new problems. And then with these uh, applications, which were not possible 20 years ago, I think there will be lots and lots new prob of new problems. Both from the device side, I, uh, side, I think uh, you guys will uh, improve this energy harvesting efficiency. Um, and then we will take your efficiency. And given that I'm able to harvest this much, you know, I don't know how to harvest energy, but give, if you give me harvested energy, then we have lots of problems to do in, in the wireless communication domain. And then who knows where this is going to go, you know, how many wireless devices we will have on our bodies, in our bodies, and around us. You know, I really don't know, but I, I feel like it's going to keep coming because uh, for 20 years, every time that I think all that, okay. And yeah, all kinds all of things. Great stuff that. Uh, yeah, I, every time that I feel like, okay, this problem, you know, is solved and where is this field going, new problems come up. So, so that's, that's for sure. The second thought is that I remember that lunch that we had together that uh, we were saying we should collaborate, we should do some things, you know, you are devices. Let's, let's <laughs> like 10 years ago. <laughs> then we said, you know, I even remember the place that, that we had lunch, right? So we, we are trying to collaborate as good colleagues. <laughs> and then we decided that, you know, may, we may not be able to understand each other. You know, to collaborate, you have to understand, at least have a common language other than English. I mean, like a common, <laughs> common language really to, you know, formulate problems, talk about problems. And then we said, you know, maybe we need somebody else in between. That, and then we decided at the end we need, we need two people, right, in between. That's right, that's right. So, you know, somebody who can talk to me and then another person who can, and then three hub uh, communication network. Yes. Then you yes. have somebody in the middle that can talk yeah. between them. Exactly, 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 yeah. So that, that, that. But it is doable. So this it is, is a good doable. message for the students and audiences. And also this, uh, this concept, I guess, of interdisciplinarity. Uh, and, and there will be, I'm sure, and there are many people uh, between you and I. Absolutely. With all those devices inside the body, we are still be allowed to drink coffee? Okay. 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 Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, let's uh, thank Professor Lucas one more time. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, because if you can't figure this out, we can develop. Yeah.
Come on, get moving. <laughs> well, not me. You guys have to come up with a smart idea. Or something. <laughs> we do, we do environmental stuff. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm just forget our sharing Oh, what's your name? I'm a faculty member. Nice to meet you. What is your position? I'm a faculty member. This is Colin Martin. But he's a he's a true meteorologist. Yes, I heard. I'm more of a physicist. I heard that's what they do. But this is a fantastic facility. I heard a lot about it. Yeah. In fact, I I want to actually one reason we came here. Uh, the Tony, Tony Busalaki is oh, the ASEC director. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 In fact, really? Oh, oh great, great. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah. We have this community that I started that these are the directors of the Ah, yeah. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. 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 So, in fact, yeah. you're coming there next time. So, uh, I'm looking forward Oh, like you take yeah. turn to come yes, along. Yes, because it's a great idea. <laughs> great idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I actually know a couple of people in uh -huh. this department. One in is, is Gangshu. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Gangshu. Yeah. yeah. What's the name? Well, maybe we could arrange for you to give us something. Because I didn't tell her mind to that. I just... <laughs> <laughs> Not ready yet. Wait a couple years. Yeah. You're <laughs> So <laughs> <laughs> to yeah, you know, we, we deal with a variety of different areas yeah. of systems. Yeah, in fact, uh, in fact, I like to consult you guys about. See, we are trying to develop a dense network of environmental sensors that will measure temperature, humidity, air pressure, air pollution, CO2, all the things. So we are actually at this stage of uh, getting into the technical details. Congratulations again. So yeah, thank you for your help. Sure, sure. It's my pleasure. Always. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. It's a great, great attendance. Yes. So we we'd like to actually consult some experts about two things. One is in terms of putting these sensors together, mm -hmm. so just the electronic circuits and. For example, we're using this Raspberry Pi computer to right. drive this sense. Right. Then we communicate with a hotspot. Mm -hmm. Then that yeah. sends it to the internet with so cell phone or we'll display it on Google Maps and stuff. Even it Do you know if anybody here could uh, you know, like give us some idea? Well, well, this is more on the <laughs> physical <laughs> side yeah. of the devices, okay. right? Yes. Not as much on the sort of the, like, the sensor network. Well, maybe you eventually that. Yeah. Uh, so I think this department, well, this institute, and my department, which is electrical engineering, and some of the faculty here, they have joined the appointment. Uh, we are very strong on the theoretical side of the sensor network, and the device side. There are people like myself that we focus on, as I said, modular devices development, but not necessarily sort of like a sensor network. You see what I'm saying? Major, you mean individual? Individual. Yeah. Right. Wow. So what I can do is, if you send me an email, I will suggest a couple of names on the sensor network theory and design that I recommend to you my among my colleagues that you could talk to. Okay. On the physical side, really the person that comes to my mind is uh, Professor Chris Davis, who has an affiliate position here in ISR. He is an optics person. Oh. And he's actually, uh, he's one of my senior faculty, uh, senior colleagues. Uh, he actually deals with a vast variety of sensor systems, but more on the physical side of it. Well, optics is great because we have a, a CO2 sensor that uses... So he doesn't infrared. develop modular devices, he may <laughs> purchase them off the shelf. Uh, but then he develops the system. That's and he has an understanding of the of some of the theory behind it, but he's he's more what I consider an okay. So he actually has a lab. He oh yeah! Oh yeah! Really oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he's the first person I recommend to you to look him up, and he's actually open to collaborations. He works with, uh, you know, he works with DARPA, he works with different agencies, but he also works with APL, with LPS. Uh, so, you know, he has had a long history of these types of collaborations. So look him up, look at some of his papers, and then also send me an email, and I try to recommend a couple of people on the theoretical side. 
Okay, sounds good. Could I have your card? Unfortunately, I, I don't have it. A card with me, but my last name is Putsi, G H O D S S R. You could just look me up. My first name is Reza. Oh, email okay. is at umd.edu. Okay. I was actually looking through the department faculty list. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> See your, see your page there. Oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> others. But the problem was, I could not, it was a, a computer engineer. Uh -huh. Here is a, what it was networking. No. I just couldn't tell exactly what no, he, no, he, no, he no, no, no. is. But you should come to the seminars. We have this yeah, once yeah. a month. And this was really arranged based on a model that they have in National Academy because this institute is very diverse. So this colloquia are sort of arranged for our faculty to get a broad sort of view and understanding of the works that are taking place here and sometimes outside of the system. Yeah, that's how I got it I through the UMERC sure. uh, stem sure. of affiliated faculty. Was that sure, yeah. Like so I mean, we had some of the people today in the audience that know the scientists, but they're listening to this topic. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. They, they mean, this kind of system idea yeah. translates everywhere. Absolutely. We, we even you're considered similar optimization. Absolutely, absolutely. Model. And you know, this, this institute is uh, traditionally very strong on the controls, optimizations, systems theory, and, and of course, network. And, uh, and we also have Yeah, okay. Very nice meeting you. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah. Yes, it was uh, quite a surprise today. But uh, I'm honored. Oh, it was a yeah. nice good thing for you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, how do I turn off this damn thing? Do you turn it off? No. It's so embarrassing. I don't know how to turn it off. Put it on the side. Just there is nothing there. I did press that. Hello. So, uh, you got a chance to review the late news? Yes. Why don't we go upstairs? Okay. I'm almost done with it. Okay, it's, that's it's been just crazy today. I understand. It's in great shape. So, I'm surprised Post is going to give you. This is off. 